Part three, chapter fourteen of Non Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Daphne at Violette. Daphne Sandomir was in the train between Cambridge and King's Cross. She was always very busy in trains, as indeed everywhere else. On this journey she was correcting the proofs of the chapter, Chapter 4, Education of the Children, which she was contributing to a volume by seven authors, shortly to appear, to be entitled alliteratively, Is Permanent Peace Possible? and to come to the conclusion that it was. Daphne Sandomir's interest in many things had always been so keen that before the war you could not have picked out one as absorbing her more than a score of others. She had been used to write pamphlets and address meetings on most of them, Eurorhythmics, for instance, and Eugenics, and the Economic and Constitutional Position of Women, and Sweated Industries, and Baby Creches, and Suggestion Healing, and Health Food, and Clean Milk, and twenty other of the causes good people have at heart. Then had come the war, an immense and horribly surprising shock, to which her healthy and vigorous mind, not shattered like some, had reacted in new forms of energy. There were in England no ladies more active through that desperate time than Daphne Sandomir and her sister Eleanor Orme, but their activities were for the most part different. Mrs Orme was secretary of a Red Cross hospital, superintended canteens, patrolled camps, relieved and entertained Belgians and dealt them out clothes, was the soul of women's work committees, made body belts, respirators and sandbags, locked up her cellar, bought war loan, and wrote sensible letters to the Times, which usually got printed. Mrs. Sandomir also relieved Belgians, got up repatriation and reconstruction societies for them, spoke at meetings of the Union of Democratic Control, to which society, as has been before mentioned, she did not belong, and of other societies to which she did belong, held study circles of working people to educate them in the principles making for permanent peace, went with a motor ambulance to pick up wounded in France, tried but failed, like so many others, to attend the Women's International Congress at The Hague, travelled round the world examining its disposition towards peace, helped to form the SPPP, Society for Promoting Permanent Peace wrote sensible letters to the Times, which sometimes got printed and sometimes not, articles in various periodicals, pamphlets on peace, education and such things, and chapters in joint books. She had just returned now from her journey round the world, where she had been interviewing a surprising number of the members of the governments of the belligerent and neutral countries, and making a study of such of the habits and points of views of their subjects as could be readily investigated by visitors. Immediately she came from Cambridge, where her home was, and where she had been starting a local branch of the SPPP, and addressing a meeting of the Heretic Society on the attitude of neutral governments towards mediation without armistice. She was a tall, graceful, vigorous person, absurdly young and beautiful, vivid, dark-eyed, clever, and tremendously in earnest about life. She had lately, it seemed lately to herself and all who knew her, gone down from Newnham, where she had done brilliantly in the economics tripos, and got engaged to Paul Sandomir, an exiled Pole studying the habits and history of the English Constitution at Fitzwilliam Hall. Their married career had been stimulating and storm-tossed, Finally, Paul Sandomir had died in a Warsaw prison, worn out with consumption, revolution and excitement. The extreme energy of the parents had always reacted on the children curiously, discounting enthusiasms and flavouring their activities with the touch of irony which one often notes in the families of one or more very zealous parents. They greatly esteemed and loved their father and mother, to them, Daphne was one of the dearest and most beautiful people in the world, if too stimulating. They felt on the whole older than she was, and worldly wise in comparison. 2. King's Cross 
Daphne, taken by surprise, seized her scattered proofs and crammed them into her dispatch box. Gathering her possessions to her, she turned to see Alex at the carriage door. "'Oh, you dear child! A porter, Alex! Do you see one? Yes, will you take them to a taxi, please?' Relieved of them, she turned with her quick, graceful movement and took the smaller Alex in her arms. Physically, mentally, morally, it was certainly Daphne who had the advantage. They got into the taxi. Daphne said to the porter, "'I think you get eighteen and six now, don't you? "'Are you married?' "'Yes, ma'am.' "'How many children?' Nine, ma'am.' "'Oh, I think not. "'You're too young for that. "'Really you are, you know. "'Let's say four. "'Well, here's eightpence. "'Tell him Spring Hill Clapton. "'Thank you so much.' The taxi sprang up the incline to the street. "'Of course,' said Daphne, frowning over it. Eighteen and six is shocking with these high prices. Goodness only knows when we're going to get it improved. But it's immoral to try and make it up by private subsidies. Is there anything the matter with our driver, child? You seem to be interested in him. I was only trying to discern how many children he's old enough to have, Alex explained. It seems nicer not to have to ask him. It's so embarrassing not being able to believe his answer. I think five is the outside limit, don't you, darling? Daphne put on her pince-nez and regarded the driver's back. Certainly not. Three of that. In fact, I doubt if he's married at all. But never mind now. I want to hear about you, child. Nicholas gave me a rather poor account of you when he wrote the other day. He seemed to think this Clapton life has been getting a little on your nerves. Oh, I don't think so. I'm all right. Daphne regarded her consideringly. Nerves, yes, you oughtn't to have any at your age, of course. No one needs at any age. You should do your rhythmics. You'd find it changed the whole of life, gave it balance, coherence, rhythm. I find it wonderful. You must certainly begin classes at once. I don't think I've time, mother. I'm going to the art school every day. I think you should make time. I hadn't much time while I was on my travels, if you come to that, but I made some to practice my eurythmics. I knew how important it was to keep fit and balanced and healthy, and that I should never be much use in influencing all those people I interviewed, so reasonable and delightful they mostly were, Alex, and simply longing for peace, I must tell you all about it, unless I kept my own poise. It's the same for you. You'll never be any use at painting or anything else while you're mentally and physically incoherent and adrift. That's one thing settled, your rhythmics. And the other is you must leave this pansy or violet or whatever it is at once, of course, and we'll take a flat. What about those Frampton Tucker people? Of course I know they're hopelessly dull and ordinary. I've met Emily Frampton very seldom, but quite often enough. A kind little mediocrity, the widow of a rather common man of business. Lawrence Frampton married her for some incomprehensible reason of his own. People do sometimes. He took her to Oxford with him and only survived it a year. They lived at Summertown. Her two girls were quite little then. I believe she was quite happy. I met her once when I was staying at Oriel. She never took in Oxford, of course. It was too many miles outside her ken, and she very sensibly hardly attempted to belong or mix. But she rather liked Summertown society, I remember. They lived in a house called Tula and kept six cats. I suppose she hasn't changed at all, probably. Probably not. She's very nice and kind. Oh, all that! Daphne waved it aside. Of course! but too stupid to be tolerable, even as a background to your day's work, no doubt. I'm sorry I've left you there so long, child. I should have thought of it before, but it was all arranged without me, and I was too busy to send you advice. I don't wonder you look a wreck. I don't, said Alex, and Cousin Emily's not bad. She's always giving me hot milk, gallons of it, an Ovaltine to make me fat, she says. She's awfully kind encouraging you to think about your constitution. No wonder you're nervy. What about the girls? Oh, they're quite good sorts. 
The younger one is good-looking, isn't she? Yes, Evie is beautiful and jolly and popular. Kate goes to church and does parish work and reads the daily thrill aloud in the evenings. Evie has young men. Her chief one just now is at the front. He's a Gordon of Gordon's jams. That sink of iniquity! The girl can have no principle. But jam is going to be nationalised very soon, I trust, like many better things. I hope so. It richly deserves it. Another thing, Alex, you must start health food. I'm going to help Linda Durrell to start a health and thrift food shop, you know. Linda's terribly unbusinesslike, of course. So many people are, if you come to that. And so many people don't eat the right things at the right moments. That man Nicky lives with now, who stayed with us, he never seems to have the faintest notion of healthy feeding. Goes out every morning before breakfast without an apple or a glass of milk. One should always begin the day with an apple, Alex. Remember that. But parsons are hopeless, of course. Such insane ideas about this world not mattering, as if it wasn't the only one we've got. I've no patience with the religious people. Can't think why Nicky lives with one of them. Though, mind, I like this Mr. West in himself. He's quite sound on most points of importance, and intelligent too. I've been on sweated industries committees with him, and I believe he's doing good work for women's trade unions. Perhaps he'll change his mind about this church business when he's older. I don't believe he will. It seems to mean rather a lot to him, doesn't it? To him it's the way of jogging the world on, as committees are to you. My dear, I detest committees. Most of their members are too stupid and tiresome for words individually, and their collective incompetence is quite unthinkable. But what other way is there in this extraordinarily stick-in-the-mud world? Alex shook her head. Indeed, she didn't know. She felt helpless to give the world any sort of jog out of its mud, by any means whatsoever. Daphne caught the blank look of her eyes, and suddenly put her strong arm round the thin, small body. "'My poor baby, you must get strong, you know, and happy. No one needs to be ailing or depressed if they'll just say to themselves, "'I'm going to be well and strong, and to stand up to the world. I'm not going to give in to it. I am the master of my body and soul.' "'I said that when our darling died. I kept on saying it, and I came through on it. There was too much to do to give way. There is still. We've got to be strong women for our own sakes and the world's, especially we who have the brains to be some use if we try. The poor old world needs help so very badly just now, with all the fools there are who hinder and block the way. You and I have both got to help, Alex. There is so much to get done. Daphne holding her close, lightly kissed the thin fingers she held. Alex thought, Mother is splendid, of course, but she's bigger than I am and stronger, and she hardly ever feels ill, and she doesn't know how Paul died, and she's not in love with Basil and didn't tell him so, and I believe she's so keen and busy that she doesn't have time to think about the war except about how to stop it. Perhaps that's the way to be thinking only how to stop it and prevent another. Is that the way? Alex became aware, from the clasp of Daphne's hands on hers, their firm, light pressure, full of purpose, that Daphne was willing her to health and happiness, trying, in fact, suggestion. Daphne believed in health suggestion as well as health food. She belonged to societies for promoting both. She had often in the past made health suggestions to Alex, but Alex had not always taken them. At the present moment Alex, overcome by the contrast between her mother's undying hope and purpose for her and her own inability to justify them, giggled weakly in the sudden way she had. "'I'm sorry, darling,' she apologised. "'No, I'm not hysterical, only footling.' I'm sorry I'm such a rotter, and no credit to you, and no use to the world. But I'm all right, really, you know. I don't need healing a bit. Daphne held her from her, scrutinised her critically, and said, You're suffering from hyperesthesia. How many cigarettes are you smoking a day? Nine. 
"'No, I'm too young for that, like the porter. Let's say three. "'Oh, I don't know. I don't count, really. Quite few. "'Cousin Emily doesn't really like it much. "'She and Kate don't smoke at all, and Evie's only just learning. "'We're not a vicious household. "'Our chief excesses are chocolates and hot milk. "'Well, my outside rule is five, you know, in peacetime, "'and now it's three. "'I should advise only two for you.' Linda Durrell is for starting and selling health cigarettes, but I won't have it. I think they're too disgusting. One must draw the line somewhere. Is this Clapton? Who lives in Clapton, by the way? I know the Secretary of the Women's Wage Increase Committee does, but who else? Of course people used to in the nineteenth century. Your great-grandfather did. And Cowper, I think. Or was it Dr. Watts? Someone who wrote hymns. "'Those look like good people's houses there. "'Yes. "'Oh, bishops live here, and retired generals, "'and stockbrokers, and thousands of babies, "'and the Vinnies, and lots of dreadfully common people, Kate says. "'They all play tennis in the park. "'This is Spring Hill. "'So I see. "'And there's Primrose. "'Tell him to stop. "'No, darling, Primrose is someone else's. "'It's Violette we want.' Do remember, mother, because the Primrose people are common, and we don't like being confused. Here we are. Three. They got out, Daphne having decided without discussion the probable size of the chauffeur's family, judicially tipped him and told him to return for her at half-past five. She then entered Violette and met Mrs. Frampton in the hall. Mrs. Frampton, like Alex and so many others, was much smaller than she was. Daphne had to bend graciously to shake hands. Mrs. Frampton was a little shy of the tall, distinguished, clever, beautiful cousin of her clever, distinguished, little-known second husband. Daphne was, in a manner, a public personage. Most people knew her name. She had for long been at once ornamental and useful a fountainhead of a perpetually vigorous stream of energies, some generally approved, others regarded by many as harmful, that watered England. But Violette, for good or ill, was outside their furthest spraying. Mrs. Frampton looked from far off, as she had looked at Professor Frampton, at the brilliant, not-to-be-understood energies of a worker in worlds by her not realised. This makes one shy, even if one believes oneself to be a denizen of a superior world, and Mrs. Frampton lacked this consolation. She was a humble person, and knew that Daphne and Professor Frampton had the best of it. They sat in the drawing-room, where there would soon be tea. Daphne looked round the room with an inward gasp. She really hadn't expected it to be quite so bad as this. The Summertown drawing-room, which she vaguely remembered, had been a little like the drawing-room of her cousin Lawrence. She took it all in rapidly, and as if hypnotised, came back to rest on Thou Seest Me, and the watching eye. My poor child, she thought, I must take her away at once. It's a wonder she's not actually had a creased a nerve, with the wretched nervous system she inherits from Paul, and that eye always watching her. Mrs. Frampton, meanwhile, was amiably talking, nervous but pleased. "'It's been so delightful having dear Alex all these months. So nice for the girls, too. We've made quite a little party of young people, haven't we, Alex? And other young people drop in quite frequently. Alex's brother, of course, which is always so very nice. He's wonderfully clever, isn't he? And that pleasant Mr. Doy, who lost his finger.' I'm sure we quite miss him now he's gone back to the army again. And friends of my girls, and friends of Alex's. Often we're quite a party. It keeps us all quite cheerful and merry, even in these dreadful days, doesn't it, Alex? Yes, said Alex. Only this child works so hard at her drawing and painting all day, she doesn't get much time for play. I'm sure they work them too hard at these art schools. She looks quite overdone and poorly, don't you think so, Mrs. Sandermere? Oh, she'll be all right directly, said Daphne, 
who didn't approve of discussing people's poor health in their presence, thinking it made them worse. "'It's mostly nerves and fancy, I expect,' she added, giving a light pat to Alex's arm. "'Shouldn't be given away to. I expect you've been spoiling her.' "'No, I haven't. No, indeed.' Mrs. Frampton was pleased. "'I have thought she looked thin and below par often, and I've made her take lots of milk, and that nice ovaltine, and even malt and cod liver oil, but she wouldn't go on with that. There's a very nice stuff that's being advertised everywhere now, fatine, and I want her to try that. Oh, Alex was always thin. I don't believe in worrying with medicines. We mustn't make her sorry for herself by talking about her like this. That's Evie, isn't it? She doesn't look as if she needed medicine anyhow. I should like to have her for an advertisement in the windows of my health food shop. Evie was followed by Kate, Florence and T. Daphne thought Kate and the teacups both deplorable. Kate had been going round her district with parish magazines. She hadn't succeeded, district visitors never do, in collecting all the pennies for them and told her mother which persons hadn't paid. And of course that Mrs Fittle in Paradise Court lay low and pretended to be out as usual. I expect she was... Kate pursed her lips, which meant drunk. Mrs Frampton nodded intelligently. The Clapton people are terribly difficult to deal with, Kate explained to Daphne. Dreadfully ungrateful too, very often. The clergy and workers may do anything for them, but it's all no more than what's their due, and no thanks, only grumbles. Do you find them like that in Cambridge? Which was the town in which Daphne, if she had one anywhere, presumably had a district. Not a bit, said Daphne briskly. The idea of expecting me to find anything so commonplace was her inward comment. This girl is the worst of the lot. Kate does a great deal of parish work, Mrs Frampton explained. She's quite busy always with church things. Yes. Daphne was vague, hiding how much she disapproved of church things. "'Now I'm afraid I'm used to a rather different sort of service from those Kate attends,' Mrs Frampton continued. "'I'm old-fashioned, I know. Kate's church goes a touch too high for me.' Something in her visitor's face, a certain blankness, suggested to her that probably Daphne knew no difference between high and low, but condemned both with impartial unfairness. She remembered that Alex hadn't been brought up to go to any sort of church. Alex, being of a later generation, had indeed a fairly open mind on these matters, but Daphne, the product of a more pronounced and condemning age, rejected with emphasis. The Christian religion as taught in churches was to her pernicious, retrograde, the hampering relic of a darker age. Some glimmering of this attitude filtered through to Mrs. Frampton and flustered her. She added, But of course we can't all think the same way about things, can we? I hope you enjoyed your trip round the world, Mrs. Sandemir. Very much, thank you. You visited the Balkans, didn't you? That must have been very alarming and wild. I'm sure it was wonderfully brave of you to go there with all this upset and all the natives so unsettled, I'm afraid I shouldn't have had the courage. The upset, said Daphne, was less advanced than it is now when I was there. I had a most interesting time. But not really, in the main, suitable to tell Mrs. Frampton about. So she rapidly selected. The Bulgarian babies. You never saw anything so pleasant. You'd love them, Mrs. Frampton. You should go there some time. And their teeth come through when they're about six weeks old for some reason. It's just as well because their ideas about milk and cleanliness are most behindhand. I talked to a sort of mother's meeting about it, but I don't think they even began to understand. I expect my Bulgarian wasn't idiomatic enough. Oh dear, the dirt of those infants. Fancy! It does seem a wickedness not to keep little babies clean, doesn't it? There's one at a house in this road, Primrose, and I'm sure it goes to one's heart to see the way it's kept. Kate said fastidiously, Those Primrose people aren't nice in any way, I'm afraid. 
"'There are some very regrettable people come settling round here lately, "'people one can't dream of knowing. "'It's a great pity.' "'People will settle, won't they?' Daphne said vaguely. "'It's better, perhaps, than being unsettled like the Balkan people.' Daphne never punned except in absence of mind, rightly believing the habit to rise from weakness of intellect. But she was thinking now not of Clapton, nor of the Balkan people, but of an address she was giving that evening to a meeting of the NUSS on her recent experiences, and which she had only inadequately prepared. She pulled herself together, however, and became charming, attentive and intelligent for the rest of tea. "'And what do you think of the United States?' Mrs. Frampton inquired. "'Will they come in, do you think, or won't the President let them, whatever occurs?' "'You met the President, didn't you? How did he strike you?' "'Oh, delightful! Like most governments, they're nearly all charming personally, I believe. So much stronger as a rule in the heart than in the head. They mean so much good and do much harm, poor dears.' A curse seems to dog them. They're the victims of an iniquitous and insane system, and they lack foresight and sound judgment so terribly for all their good intentions. You would scarcely say the Kaiser had good intentions, Mrs. Frampton suggested dubiously. Daphne said, I don't know him, but I'm told he has all sorts, good and bad, like other mischievous people. "'We all know anyhow where good intentions pave the way to,' said Kate, more epigrammatic than usual, so that Mrs. Frampton said, "'Hush, dear,' and added, "'He'll have to face the consequences of action some day when he's called to give account of his life. Perhaps we oughtn't to forestall his condemnation, poor man.' Daphne said, "'Indeed, I'm quite sure we ought. Condemnation will be singly little use at the moment you refer to.' And then, because that moment would be a fruitless and indeed most unsuitable topic of conversation between her and Mrs. Frampton, she left it and talked about flats in town, a subject which she and Violette regarded from standpoints very nearly as far sundered as those from which they contemplated the last judgment. After tea, Mrs. Frampton said she and Kate and Evie would now go away and leave Daphne and Alex alone together, which they did. The door shut behind them, and Daphne passed her long, capable hand over her forehead and shut her eyes for a moment. "'My dear child, what you have been through! It must end at once. So kind and so unthinkably trying. No wonder. Oh, well, never mind. You'll soon be all right now. Do they know anything about anything that matters? No, quite obviously not.' I'd rather they didn't, mother. I don't like the things that matter. I've been quite comfortable. Comfortable? With that eye? Nonsense, child. The idea of our having such relations, even by marriage. Lawrence Frampton was really too queer. I've often wondered whether his head wasn't a little going when he did it. He had been peculiar in several ways. Quite suddenly voted conservative. Which years was it now? I think myself life had tired him. People wanted to abolish Greek in responsions and so on, and he had some worries in his college, and private money difficulties too, I believe. Oxford people are so extravagant sometimes. So he fell back on a little cushiony wife, as one might onto a pillow, and died quietly soon afterwards. Most tragic, really. Such a brilliant fellow he was. Now there's my taxi back again. I'm going first to Nicky's, then to dine at the club with Francie Claverhouse before addressing the NUWSS. By the way, I'm fearfully out of temper with them. Have you been following their policy lately? They've been criminally weak on conscription. We shall have to have a split as usual. Goodbye, darling. Run and fetch your cousin Emily to say goodbye to me. No, only your cousin Emily. I can't speak to Kate. She's the epitome of all the ages of the drab and narrow feminine. And Evie is immoral and carries on with Gordon's jam. It isn't right that you should be here. 
none of them have any principles. While she talked, Daphne was collecting her bags, papers and furs, with her quick, graceful, decisive movements. Alex watched her, feeling as she sometimes did in her mother's presence, as if she sucked up all the ozone in the air and left none for her. They found Mrs. Frampton in the hall, full of shy and beaming kindness. Daphne took her hand and looked down on her cordially. I must be flying. I'll look in tomorrow if I may. Goodbye, and thank you so much for being good to the child. The narrow Kate and the immoral Evie appeared in the background, and Daphne had to shake hands with them after all before escaping into the taxi. 4. Violette watched her drive away up Spring Hill. Evie thought how handsome she was, and how well she wore her clothes. Kate was not quite certain she wasn't a touch fast. Alex thought, how jolly it must be to be like mother, so certain and so strong. Mrs. Frampton thought, she seemed so nice and clever, but a little alarming, perhaps, and said to Alex, your mother seems wonderfully well and busy. I expect she's always quite full of plans and occupation and interests, isn't she? Yes, said Alex. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Non-Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Alex at a Meeting Daphne took Alex from Violette to stay with her at her club. It was the end of November. Daphne proposed that they should spend a fortnight in town till the end of the art school term then go down to their house at Cambridge for the Christmas vacation. She meant to spend this period holding meetings about the county of Cambridgeshire with a view to starting village branches of the Society for Promoting Permanent Peace. Meetings, branches, study circles, this was the machinery behind the ideals. Daphne, at times irrelevant, inconsequent, prejudiced, whimsical, perverse, was an idealist, and a businesswoman. She made Alex come to meetings while they were in town. She saw in Alex the raw material of a member of the SPPP. She said, You mustn't be selfish, darling. You are a little selfish, you know, and you're old enough now to leave it off. You try to hide from things like an ostrich. You try and pretend they don't exist. In point of fact, they do, and you know it. You know it all the time. You can't forget it, so you waste your trouble trying. You must leave that to the Violettes. They can ignore. You can't. Ignoring. That's always been the curse of this world. We shut our eyes to things, poverty and injustice and vice, and cruelty and sweating and slums, and the tendencies which make war, and we feed ourselves on batter, and so on from day to day getting a little fatter. And so the evils too go on from day to day getting fatter, till they get so corpulent and heavy that when we do open our eyes at last, because we have to, they can scarcely be moved at all. It's sheer criminal selfishness and laziness and stupidity. Mr. West was talking about it the other day. I like that young man. He believes in all the right things, and in so many of the wrong ones as well. I can't imagine why. I told him I couldn't imagine why, and he said he found the same difficulty about me. So there we are. However, what was I saying? Oh, yes, laziness, selfishness and stupidity. It's those three we've got to fight. We've got to replace them by hard working, hard living and hard thinking. And the last must come first. We've got to think and make everyone think. One of the worst things about a war is that so many of the best thinkers are in the middle of it and can't think and may never be able to think again. 
I don't in the least agree with those complacent young men and women who believe that no one over forty either can or will think. The war has let the old men loose upon the world, I believe is the phrase. Conceited rubbish, of course. They won't talk it when they and their friends are forty-eight, like me. Personally, I know just about as many young fools and obscurantists and militarists as elderly ones. Any number of both. It's not a question of age. It's temperament and training. But still, grant that the young men of fighting age form a very large proportion in each nation of the clearest intellects and the keenest idealists and the best workers for truth, and that they are nearly all now in action or put out of action. Grant that many of them will never come back, that many others will come back weakened physically and mentally and incapable of the work they might have done before, and some, perhaps, with their mental vision a little blinded and perverted by what they've had to play a part in for so long. That's the worst tragedy of all, of course, that possible perversion. Better never come back at all. Daphne's voice shook momentarily, but she went on bravely. Paul would have been a fine worker. He was going to be very like his father. Well, Paul's gone under. A sacrifice to the brute. Thousands of other finely wrought instruments like Paul have been smashed and lost to the world. It's an irreparable tragedy, of course. But we who are left and who are free have got to do their work as well as our own. And we've got to begin at once. There's no time to be lost. Daphne consulted her watch, and added, "'You'd better come to a meeting of the SPPP at Queen's Hall with me after dinner, dearest. It would interest and instruct you. Several people are going to speak, including me.' "'It's all right when you speak,' said Alex. "'But some of them are rather the limit, really, mother.' "'Oh, my dear, of course. The very outside edge. Over it. What does it matter?' It's causes that count, thank goodness, not the people who work for them. When you're my age, you'll have learnt to swallow people without getting indigestion. Now we must have dinner at once, and then you shall come and begin to practice impersonal idealism. It is so important. 2. Alex supposed it must be. Meetings are so very mixed, speeches so unequal, people so various. Lack of clear thinking, that, as Daphne had said, was probably what was wrong with nearly everyone. Perhaps it is the commonest defect, and the most irritating. It makes people talk sentimental rubbish. It makes them lump other people together in masses and groups, setting one group against another, when really people are individual temperaments and brains and souls, and unclassifiable. It makes them say... Alex picked out all these utterances in the Queen's Hall tonight, among many other utterances, truer and sounder and more relevant, indeed indubitably sound, relevant and true, that young men are good and intelligent and pacifist, no, pacifist, and admire Roman Roland, and elderly men bad, stupid and militarist, and admire Ben Hardy. That women are the guardians of life, and therefore mind war more than men do, that democracies are inherently and consistently peaceful enough, stated, and intelligent enough, assumed, to prevent wars from ever occurring if the reins of foreign policy were in their hands. Rubbish, muttered Daphne. He's missing the whole point, which is to make democracies so by a long and difficult education. Everyone knows they're not much sense yet. That the reason why war is objectionable is that the human body is sacred and should be inviolate. What did that mean precisely, Alex wondered? That women are the chief sufferers from war? A debatable point, anyhow. And what did it matter? And why divide humanity into sexes further than nature has already done so? That among the newspaper owners and members of the governments of each nation were some so misguided and lacking in financial foresight as to encourage wars because they had some shares in armament industries and hoped, presumably, to recoup themselves therefrom for the heavy financial losses which they, in common with all other members of the community, must suffer in case of war. Fools they must be, 
Alex commented, and speculated that these covetous individuals, even granting that they had pinned their hopes entirely on the financial issue, must be feeling pretty badly sold. For their other and nicer shares would be declining. Their income tax was enormous, and they probably had to pay super tax too, which was even worse. The papers they owned were losing the advertisements they lived by, and their food cost them more. A bad lookout for those covetous ones. From this the speaker got on to capitalism in general. Well, Alex was entirely with him there. A new speaker, much better, quite good in fact, was speaking of secret ententes, the speaker's will at these meetings. The Moroccan crisis, that was rather interesting. The balance of power, a rotten theory, but surely as things were necessary. Yes, as things were, but not as they were going to be. For there must, in time, be general disarmament. Disarmament. A fancy some lean to, and others hate, no doubt. But most hate it. The question was, would they hate it more after this war, or less? Si vis bellum, para bellum, that was the true version of that saying. True, for it had been proved so. Look at the Germans, preparing for war for years. Look at all the other nations, also preparing for years. And now they had all got it. That is what armies and fleets lead to. So instead of armies and fleets, let us have international councils for arbitration. A concert for Europe. A jolly sound notion, thought Alex, but wished the speaker would meet rather more precisely the obvious difficulties in the way of this method of keeping the peace. It certainly was a sound notion. One felt that it could, after much shaping and experiment and failure, be workable, be made something of. There was no earthly reason why not. And certainly the more it was discussed and publicly aired in all the nations, the better for its chances. But people were apt on this subject not to be quite practical enough. They often laid stress on the advantages of the principle, rather than on its detailed methods of working. Of course the advantages, if it could be worked, were incontrovertible. Surely no one could be found to question them. And here Alex found a weakness she had vaguely felt before in the standpoint taken by many of these people. Many of them, not nearly all, but many, seem to imply we, a select few of us called pacifists, hate war. The rest of you rather like it. We will not allow you to have it. We will stop it. As if some of the race, stricken with agonising plague, had risen up and said to the rest, you, most of you, are content to be ill and in anguish and perishing, but we do not like it. We insist on stopping it and preventing its recurrence. An admirable resolution, but ill-worded. What they meant, what they would mean if they thought and spoke accurately, was surely, we all loathe this horror. How should anyone not loathe it? We all want to stop it occurring again, and we have thought of a way which we believe may work. This is it. That was sense. That was what was wanted that anyone who thought they had found a way should use it and expound it to the rest. But, oh, it wasn't sense, it was madness, to talk as if people differed in aim and desire, not merely in method. For there was one desire everyone had in these days, beneath, through and above their thousand others. People wanted money, wanted victory, wanted liberty, wanted economic individualism, wanted socialism, wanted each other, wanted love, wanted beauty, wanted virtue, wanted a vote, wanted fame, wanted genius, wanted God, wanted things to drink, even to eat, wanted more wages, wanted less taxes, less work, wanted children, wanted adventure, wanted death, wanted democracy, oligarchy, anarchy, any other archy, wanted new clothes, wanted a new heaven, or a new earth, or both, wanted the old back again, wanted the moon. They wanted any or all of these things, and a thousand more, but through them, above them, beneath them, a quenchless fire of longing, burning, searing and consuming, more passionately as the crazy weeks of frustration swung by, they wanted peace. 
even some who wanted nothing else in this world or any other just had energy to want peace there were those so tired and so forlorn and so battered and broken that they could scarcely want at all they had lost too much they had almost too utterly lost their health or their courage or their limbs or their hope or their faith or their sons husbands brothers lovers and friends or their minds to want anything from life except its end but still with broken drifting numbed desires they wanted peace all the heterogeneous crowd of humanity so at variance in almost everything else was just now surely one in the common bond of that great desire they swayed that heterogeneous crowd into alex's giddy vision she saw them thus strangely perhaps unwelcomely linked in incongruous fellowship those who had possibly never before believed themselves to want the same things the one desire linked in all the warring nations socialists and individualistic men of business capitalists and wage earners slum landlords and slum dwellers judges and criminals soldiers and conscientious objectors catholics and quakers atheists and priests prize fighters and poets representatives of societies differing so widely in some ways as the fellowship of reconciliation and the national service league the w s p u and the anti-suffrage society the union of democratic control and the anti-german league the german social and democratic party and the radicals the staffs of journals as widely sundered by temperament and habit as the times and the manchester guardian the morning post and the daily news the spectator and the english review the Vorwärts and the kreuz zeitung the church times the freethinker and the record alex saw humanity as a great mass meeting men and women clergymen lawyers lords and thieves hand in hand lifting together one confused voice crying for peace peace where there was no peace where there could not yet be nor ever had been peace because because of what that really seemed the question to be solved because one supposed of some anti-peace elements in every country in every class in every interest nay in every human being that somehow subverted and hindered the great desire an odd world certainly and paradoxical and curiously tragic but lit by glimmers of hope three more and more through that evening alex came to believe that these so-called pacifists idiotic name as if every one wasn't pacifist really had found a way really had if not exactly their hands on the ropes anyhow their feet on a road that might possibly lead somewhere it was the same rather breathless feeling of possible ways out or in that she heard about the church sometimes only sometimes for at other times she happened on people who belonged to the church who made her feel that there were no roads out or in or anywhere but only dull enclosures leading nowhere and she hadn't yet attained to the impersonal idealism daphne urged on her so necessary so difficult a thing which could swallow people for the sake of the causes they stood for she attached too much importance to people she was glad when a young keen-faced humorous woman with a charming voice began to speak about continuous mediation without armistice a fascinating subject competently handled a continuous conference of the neutral nations to convey the ever-changing desires of the belligerents to one another to inquire into the principles of international justice and permanent peace underlying them to discuss to air proposals to suggest to promote understanding between belligerents it couldn't anyhow do much harm and might do much good it would express the views of impartial observers are any observers impartial alex wondered on these vexed questions it would express through intermediaries the views of the peace seekers in each warring nation to the peacemakers in the others now that they were hindered from direct speech together for so many thousands in the enemy countries are longing for peace 
There must be no mistake about that. Of course, thought Alex, impatient again. How should there be any mistake about so obvious a thing? The only difficulty was that each country longed for peace on its own terms. Peace, as they would say, with honour. And no country liked its enemies' terms. This continuous mediation business would perhaps draw them nearer together, make them see more nearly eye to eye. It certainly seemed sound. 4. They're talking sense, all right, said one young officer to another behind Alex. Then Daphne spoke, on the attitude towards war of the common people in the neutral and belligerent nations, on principle of education, and particularly on the training of children in sound international ideals, her special subject. She told of how in Austria the Women's Committee for Permanent Peace had issued an appeal to parents and teachers, urging them to counteract the influences exciting children to race hatred, and train them in respect for their enemies and constructive national service. A comprehensive subject, treated with breadth, detail and clarity. The young officers again approved. Alex thought how fine a person Daphne looked and was, gracious, competent, vivid, dominating, alive, possessed of some poise, some strength, some inner calm. What was it exactly and why? One saw it in some religious people, perhaps in them and in Daphne. It was the same thing. They both had a definite aim. They both knew where they were trying to go and why. Perhaps that is what makes for strength and calm, thought Alex. Daphne wasn't running away from things or from life. She was facing them and fighting them. She's good, isn't she? said one of the officers. I like hearing Mrs. Sandermere. She never talks through her hat. So many of these pacifist and militarist people do. Alex was glad Daphne had a sense of humour and didn't rant or sentimentalise. She could talk of the part to be played by women in the construction of permanent peace without calling them the guardians of the race or the custodians of life. She didn't draw distinctions, beyond the necessary ones, between women and men. She took women as human beings, not as life-producing organisms. She took men as human beings, not as destroying machines. She spoke about propaganda work to be undertaken by the SPPP in the country districts. She suggested methods. She became very practical. Alex listened with interest, for that was what Daphne was going to do in Cambridgeshire in the Christmas vacation. It sounded as foreshadowed, sensible and useful, though of course you never know, with meetings in the country, till you try, and not always then. 5. Enough, more than enough, no doubt, has been said of a meeting so ordinary as to be familiar in outline to most people. That it was not familiar to Alex, who had hitherto avoided both meetings and literature on all subjects connected with the war, is why it is here recorded in some detail. There was some more of it, but it need not be here set down. When it was over, Daphne and Alex returned to the club, they sat in the writing-room and talked and smoked before going to bed. "'Rather sensible on the whole, I thought,' said Alex, lighting Daphne's cigarette. She had more colour than usual, and her eyes were bright and sleepless. Daphne glanced at her sidelong. "'Glad you're proved,' she said. "'The SPPP is rather sensible on the whole, just that. What about joining it on those grounds?' It will only bind you to approve of its general programme, and when you can assist in it. And its programme is really purely educational, training people, beginning with ourselves, in the kind of thinking and principles which seem to make for international understanding and peace. You'd better join us. We're fighting war to the best of our lights, and with the weapons at our command. One can't do more than that in these days, and one can scarcely do less. One mayn't be very successful, and one may be quite off the lines, but one has to keep trying in the best way one personally knows. One can't be indifferent and inert nowadays. Well? Alex leant forward and dropped her cigarette end into the fire. Well, she returned, 
and thought for a moment and added, I wonder. I'm not really good at joining things, you know. You are not, Daphne agreed decisively. You sit on hedges, criticising the fields on both sides and wondering what good either of them is going to be to you. Such a paltry attitude, my dear. Unpractical, selfish and sentimental. Though I know you think you hate sentimentality. It's quite time you learnt that there's no fighting with whole truths in this life, and all we can do is to seize fragments of truth where we can find them and use them as best we can. Poor weapons, perhaps, but all we've got. That's how I see it, anyhow. Well, darling, at least it can't do any harm to try and get children and grown-up people taught to get some understanding of international politics and the ways to keep the peace or to look upon arbitration as a possible, practical and natural substitute for war, can it now? If it only in the end results in improving ever so slightly the mental attitude of a person here and there, adding ever so little to the political information of a village in each country, it will have done something, won't it? And, you never know, it may do quite a lot more than that. You must remember we've got branches in all the belligerent countries now. Free discussion of these things gets them into the air, so to speak, trains people's ways of thought, and thought, collective thought, is such a solid driving power. It gets things done. Thoughts are alive, said Daphne, waving her cigarette as she talked, frightfully, terrifyingly, amazingly alive. They fly about like good and bad germs. They cause health or disease. They can build empires or slums. They can assault and hurt the soul. Unconsciously, in moments of enthusiasm, Daphne sometimes used a prayer book phrase stored in her memory cells from childhood, for her father had been a bishop. Or they can save it alive. They can make peace and make war. They made this war. They must make the new peace. Thought is everything. We've got to make good, sane, intelligent thought, however and wherever we can, all of us. Come and work with me in Cambridgeshire next week and help me to make it, my dear. Well, said Alex again, I might do that. Come and watch you, I mean, and listen. I think I will do that. 6. It was late. Everyone in the club except them had gone to bed. They went too. Alex thought in bed, fighting war. That's what Mr. West said we must all be doing, fighting war. I suppose really it's the only thing non-combatants can do with war, to make it hurt them less, as they can't go. She wrenched her mind sharply away from that last familiar negation that old familiar bitterness of frustration. I suppose, she thought, it may make even that hurt less. On that thought, selfish by habit as usual, a thought not suggested by Daphne, who was not selfish, she fell asleep. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of Non Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. On Peace. On the tenth of December, Daphne, Alex, and Nicholas went down to Cambridge. Liverpool Street, Alex found restful. Liverpool Street, as the jumping off place for East Anglia, has a soothing power of its own. Stations often have, probably because they indicate ways of escape, never the closed door. But Cambridge, which they reached all too soon, was not restful. Cambridge City, even out of term time, even during terms such as these, which all the young thinkers are keeping in trenches overseas, is too conscious of the world's complexities and imminent problems and questionable destinies to be peaceful. Cambridge is the brain of Cambridgeshire, which, having all its more disturbing thinking thus done for it, can itself remain quiet, like a brainless animal. Daphne's sphere of work did not include Cambridge, 
which already thought about these things and heard, gladly and otherwise, Mr. Ponsonby on democratic control and Lord Bryce on international relations and many other people on many other subjects. All she did in Cambridge was to foster and stimulate the life of the already existing branch of the SPPP and to make it her centre for propaganda in Cambridgeshire. Nicholas and Alex, having been brought up in Cambridge, did not know Cambridgeshire much. Alex discovered Cambridgeshire through this quiet, pale December. There are moments in some lives when it is the only shire that will do. Many feel the same about Oxfordshire, more about Shropshire, Sussex, Worcestershire, Hampshire, or the North, or the South West. The present writer once knew someone who felt it about Warwickshire, but these probably are few. Most people may like Warwickshire, to live in, or walk in, or bicycle in, but will give it no peculiar place as healer or restorer. It is perhaps essentially a shire for the prosperous, the whole in body and mind. It has little to give beyond what it receives. But Cambridgeshire, of all England the shire for men who understand, in its quiet, restrained way, gives... It is not for the rich, and not for sentimentalists, and not for Americans, but it is for poets and dreamers. To those who leave it and return, it has a fresh and sad significance, like the face of a once familiar and understood, but half-forgotten friend, whose point of view has become strange. New meanings, old meanings reasserted, rise to challenge them. The code of values inherent in those chalky plains that are the setting of a quiet city seem to emerge in large type. Cambridge is of a quite different spirit. In Cambridge is intelligence, culture, traditionalism, civilization, some intellectualism, even some imagination, much scholarship, ability and good sense, above all a high idealism, a limitless fund of generous chivalry, that will be at war with the world's ills, the true crusading spirit that can never fit in with the commercial. And round it, strangely, lies Cambridgeshire, quiet, chalky, unknown, full of the equable Anglian peoples and limitless romance, the country of waste fens and flat wet fields and dreamy hints of quiet streams and grey willows and level horizons melting into blue distance beyond blue distance and straight white roads linking ancient village to ancient village and untold dreams. And probably not one Cambridge person in two hundred understands anything at all about it. They are too civilised, too urban, too far above the animal and the peasant. Here and there some Cambridge poet or painter or even archaeologist has caught the spirit of Cambridgeshire, but mostly Cambridge people are too busy and too alive to try. You need to be of a certain vacancy. But though they understand so little of it, in times of need it sometimes raises quiet hands of healing to them. Sometimes again it doesn't. 2. Alex, wandering over it with Daphne, who held meetings, found it grey, toneless, faintly-hued, wintry, with larks carolling over the chalky downs and brown ploughed fields. That country south of Cambridge seemed to her the truest Cambridgeshire, rather than the level plains of Ely and the Fenlands, and rather than the border regions of the north-west, where Royston, among its huddle of strange hills, broods with its hint of a hostile wildness. Royston is rather terrifying, unless you use it for golf, and Daphne had a poor meeting there. Meetings in Cambridge are often poor, that is the truth, excepting only in election time, when apathy gives place to fierce excitement. Whether they are about national service, or votes for women, or tariff reform, or free trade, or Welsh disestablishment, or recruiting, or peace, you cannot really rely on them. Cambridgeshire, rightly believing that the day for toil was given, for rest the night, does not lightly thwart this dispensation of providence. And the few borderland hours of twilight or lamplight, 
which providence has set between these two spaces of time are there seems little doubt given us for the purposes of tea smoking conversing and courting so meetings do not really come in but daphne held them all the same and some people came she usually held them in the village schoolroom sometimes she got the vicar's permission to address the children during school hours sometimes that of the vicar's wife to speak to the mother's meetings while it met but she preferred evening meetings because of her lantern slides which showed the photographs she had taken on her travels of men women and children in the other villages of other countries thinking so she said the same thoughts as these men women and children in cambridgeshire saying in their queer other tongues the same things playing very often with the same toys this of course was by way of promoting international sympathy the women and children liked these meetings and slides the women being open-hearted kindly impressionable pacific saw what daphne meant and said to think of it i expect those mothers poor things miss their boys that are fighting the same as we do ours well it isn't their fault is it it's all that wicked kaiser the children said merely oh ah look at that then daphne would go on from that starting point to expound that it wasn't all not quite all that wicked kaiser that it was in fact in varying degrees not only all governments but all peoples who had made war possible and so landed themselves at last in this this was less popular the women didn't mind it they were receptive and open to conviction and didn't much mind either way and were prepared to say well to be sure we're none of us very good christians yet are we for ideas didn't matter to them very much nor the wrongs and rights of the war but the fact of the war did but some man behind who had made up his mind on this business and knew that black was black and white was white would sometimes observe with vigour and decision pro hun i am not a pro any one said daphne nor an anti any one but i am in general way pro peace and anti war and i am sure we all are in this room then those who believed themselves to differ would shout fight to finish crush all germans and smash the hun then you may talk of peace and here's some soldiers back here you hear what they've got to say about it and other things to the same purpose and once or twice they sang patriotic songs so loud that the meeting closed in disorder but at other times they gave daphne a chance to explain that she meant by peace peace in general and in future not a premature end to this particular war that end she remarked must now be left to be decided by others it was the future they were all concerned with when once she got through to this point the room usually began to listen again and heard with varying degrees of attention interest and tolerance how they could help to make a permanent peace and even put up good-humouredly with hearing how they had helped for some centuries to make war by encouraging commercialism capitalism selfishness ignorance and bad habits of thought on the whole and with exceptions so far as cambridgeshire listened to daphne at all it was receptive and not unkind the villages of course varied as villages will in some the squire and the vicar and the other chief people would not allow the meeting at all rightly thinking it pacifist in others they allowed it and came and sat in front and differed asking daphne if she had not heard the recommendation si vis parcem parabellum and remarking that while we are in a war it's not the time to talk of peace you might as well say said daphne that while we are suffering from a plague is not the time to talk of measures to prevent its recurrence villages as has been said differ some for instance are more intelligent than others great shelford is rather intelligent and means well many of its inhabitants are leisured and will readily if advised form study circles and read recommended literature in fact they did quite a promising little nucleus of the s p p p was established there sawston two miles and a half away is otherwise so is whittlesford of linton 
Hampersford, Landbeach, Waterbeach, the Chesterfords and Duxford, it were better, in this connection, not to speak. Frankly, they did not understand or approve the SPPP. They thought it pro-German. "'That silly word!' said Daphne helplessly to Nicholas, after a rather exhausting evening at Sawston. Nicholas's own evening had been restful, for he had spent it at home reading Russian fairy stories. "'What does it mean? Do they mean anything by it? Do they know what they mean?' "'Oh, they know all right,' returned Nicholas, grinning. "'They mean you've exaggerated sympathies with the Hun.' "'Have I?' Daphne wondered. "'Well, I suppose one tries to have some sympathies with everyone, "'even with nations which prepare for and start wars "'and brutally destroy small adjacent nations in the process, "'but as little, almost as little, with these as it is possible to have.' When will people understand that what we're out to do is not to sympathise or to apportion blame, but simply to learn together the science of reconstruction? No, of construction, rather, for we've got to make what's never yet been. People do so leave things to chance, mental and spiritual things. When it's a case of reconstructing material things, as we shall have to do in Belgium and France after the war, no one will be allowed to help without proper training. People are training for it already, taking regular courses in the various branches of constructive science. But we seem to think that the nations can build themselves up spiritually without any learning or preparing at all. Just because it's not towns and villages and trades and wealth and agriculture that will need building up, but only intelligence and beauty and sanity and mind and morals and manners. The building up has got to be done in the same industrious and practical spirit. You can't leave spiritual things to grow into the right shape for themselves any more than material ones. You've got to have your constructionists with their constructive programmes. You can't leave things to luck, sit down and say, trust in time, the great mender, or wait and see. Time isn't a member of anything. Time, unused, is like an aged idiot plodding along a road without signposts into nowhere. We can't each go about our individual businesses grabbing our share of the world without troubling ourselves to get a grasp of the whole and help to shove it along the right track. It's uneducated. It's like the modern Cretan, so different from his early ancestors, who saw life steadily and saw it whole. At least that's what one gathers from his remains. Daphne had just before the war been in Crete excavating. Nicholas said, You overrate the early Cretan. I've noticed it before. You overrate him. He wasn't all you think, and anyhow, he had a smaller island to think out. Anyone could have got a grasp of Cretan affairs. He was probably really as selfish as, as Alex or me. I can't imagine said Daphne, considering him with disapproval. Why, you don't join the SPPP, Nicky, or some other good educative society, and help me a little. I? I never join anything. I never agree with anybody. I don't want to educate anyone. Why should I? I leave these things to enthusiasts with faith, like you and West. I've no faith in my own ideas being any better than other people's, so I let them go their ways and I go mine. "'You won't always do that,' Daphne told him, encouraging him, because she had faith in the spirit of his father's, which looked, despite himself, out of his eyes. "'When you're my age, I shall then,' said Nicholas, "'doubtless be suffering from what is, I believe, called by the best people, the more embittered temper and narrower faith of age. "'You need entertain no further hopes for me then.' Three. During the Hawkston meeting, which was in the schoolroom on the afternoon of New Year's Eve, Alex sat on the low churchyard wall in faint sunshine and looked over brown fields and heard the larks. Hawkston is quiet and smells of straw and has a little grey church with a Norman door. Its road runs east and west and there are geese on the little green. On this last afternoon of the year, it lay quietly asleep in the pale winter sunshine. Whenever the little east wind moved, wisps and handfuls of straw drifted lightly down the road. 
the larks carolled and twittered exuberantly over bare fields. From time to time a flock of chaffinches rose suddenly from the ricks and flew, a chattering flutter of wings, down the wind. Beyond the fields, cold, faintly-hued horizons brooded. Hawkston looked drowsily to the sunset and the dawn, to the past and future, to the old year and the new. "'The future is dubious,' Daphne had been saying in the schoolroom before Alex came out. "'Well, of course, futures always are, if you come to that. "'In this dim, dubious future, let us see that we build up one positive thing which will not fail us.' "'And by that, of course, she meant peace. "'Peace. "'Yes, peace must be, of course, a positive thing. "'Here in Hawkston was peace.' a bare, austere, quiet peace smelling of straw. No one had had to make that peace. It just was. But the world's peace must be made, built up, stone on stone. No, stones were a poor figure. Peace must be alive, a vital, intricate, intense, difficult thing. No negation, not the absence of war not the quiet, naturally attained peace of Samuel Miller and Elizabeth his wife, who slept beneath a grey headstone close to the churchyard wall, having drifted into peace after ninety and ninety-five years of living, and having for their engraven comment, they shall come to the grave in the fullness of years, like as a shock of corn cometh in in his season." not that natural peace of the old and weary at rest but a young peace passionate ardent intelligent romantic like poetry like art like religion like christmas with its peace on earth good will towards men like all the passionate restless idealism that the so quiet seeming little norman church stood for Alex believed that it stood for the same things that Daphne stood for. It too would say, build up a living peace. It too would say, let each man, woman and child cast out first from their own souls the forces that make against peace. Stupidity, that first. Then commercialism, rivalries, hatreds, grabbing, pride, ill-bred vaunting. It too was international, supernational. It too was out for a dream, a wild dream of unity. It too bade people go and fight to the death to realise the dream. Only it said, in my name they shall cast out devils and speak with new tongues. And the SPPP said, in the name of humanity. There was no doubt a difference in method but at the moment Alex had more concern with the likenesses, with the common aim of the fighters, rather than with their different flags. The pale sun dipped lower in the pale west, and was drowned in haze. It was cold. The little wind from the east whispered along the bare hedges. The year would soon be running down into silence, like an old clock. 4. Daphne and the meeting came out of the school. Alex went to meet her. Daphne looked satisfied, as if things had gone well. The few women and many children coming out of the meeting looked good-hearted and still full of Christmas cheer. "'Such dears,' said Daphne, as they got into the car. Lest a damaging impression of Daphne be given, it may be mentioned that she always drove her own car herself, and only, in wartime, used it for meetings for the public good and for taking out wounded soldiers. So attentive and nice. I left pamphlets, and I'm coming again after the Christmas holiday to speak to the children in school. I told them about German and Austrian babies. The mothers loved it. It's fun doing this. People are such dears, directly they stop misunderstanding what one is after understanding, clear thinking, it nearly all turns on that. Everything does. Oh, for more brains in this poor old muddle of a world. Educate the children's brains, give them right understanding, and then let evil do its worst against them. They'll have a sure base to fight it from. 
Alex thought of and mentioned the intelligent bad, who are surely numerous and prominent in history. But Daphne said, "'Cleverness isn't right understanding. I mean something different from that. I mean the trained faculty of looking at life and everything in it the right way up. It's difficult, of course.' Alex thought it was probably impossible in an odd, upside-down world. The sun set. The face of Cambridgeshire, the face of the new year, the face of the incoherent world, was dim and inscrutable, a dream lacking interpretation. So many people can provide, according to their several lights, both the dream and the interpretation thereof, but with how little accuracy. 5. The Sandomirs in their house in Grange Road saw the new year in. They drank its health, as they did every year. Daphne, though she suddenly could think of nothing but Paul, who would not see the new or any other year, nevertheless drank unflinching to the causes she believed in. "'His to the new world we shall make in spite of everything,' she said. "'His to construction, sanity and clear thinking. "'His to goodwill and mutual understanding. "'His to the clearing away of the old messes "'and the making of the new ones. "'His to freedom. "'His to peace.' "'Heaven help you, mother,' Nicholas murmured drowsily into his glass. "'You don't know what you're saying. "'All your toasts are incompatible, and you don't see it. "'And what in the name of anything do you mean by freedom?' The old messes I know, and the new ones I can guess at. But what is freedom? Something, anyhow, which we've never had yet. Something we shall have, said Daphne. You think so? But how improbable. After war, despotism, and the strong hand. You don't suppose the firm hand is going to let go, having got us so nicely in its grasp? Rather not. War is the tyrant's opportunity. The government's beginning to learn what it can do. After all this defending of the realm and cancelling of scraps of paper such as Magna Carta and habeas corpus and ordering the press and controlling industries and finance and food and drink and saying, let there be darkness, and there was darkness, you don't suppose it's going to slip back into laissez-faire or open the door to mob rule? The realm will go on being defended long after it's weathered this storm, depend on it. And quite right, too. Lots of people will prefer it. They'll be too tired to want to take things into their own hands. They'll only want peace and safety and an ordered life. They'll be too damaged and sick and have lost too much to be anything but apathetic. Peace, possibly, though improbably. But freedom? No. Anyhow, it's what neither we nor anyone else have ever had, so we shouldn't recognise it if we saw it. There are too many pips in this stuff, he grumbled, much too many. Daphne finished hers and stood up, as midnight struck, with varying voices and views as to the time from various church clocks in Cambridge City. So, she said, that's the end of that year. No doubt it is as well. And now I'm going to bed. I've a great deal to do tomorrow. She went to bed. She had a great deal to do on all the days of the coming year. But the first thing she did, in common with many others this year, was to cry on the stairs, because it was a year which Paul would never see, Paul having been tipped out by the last year in its crazy career and left behind by the wayside. 6. Nicholas and Alex lay languidly in fraternal silence in their chairs, they never went to bed or did anything else with Daphne's prompt decision. At a quarter past twelve, Alex said, I'm thinking of joining this funny society of mothers. Nicholas opened his small blue eyes at her. You are? I didn't know you joined things. Nor did I, said Alex, but I'm beginning to believe I do. I think I shall very probably join the church too before long. Nicholas opened his eyes much wider and sat up straight. The church? The Church of England, do you mean? I suppose that would be my branch, as I live in England. Just the Christian church, I mean. Do you think Mother'll mind much? 
Nicholas cogitated over this. Probably, he concluded, she doesn't like it, you know. She thinks it stands for darkness. That's so funny, said Alex, when really it seems to me to stand for all the things she stands for, and some more, of course. Exactly, Nicholas agreed. It's the more she takes exception to. Oh, well, Alex sighed a little. Mother's very large-minded, really. She'll get used to it. Nicholas was looking at her curiously, but non unsympathetically. Why these new and sudden energies? he inquired presently, if you don't mind my asking. It's what I told you once before, Alex explained, and the memory of that anguished evening attenuated her clear, indifferent voice, making it small and fainter. As I can't be fighting in the war, I've got to be fighting against it. Otherwise it's like a ghastly nightmare, swallowing one up. This society of mothers mayn't be doing much, but it's trying to fight war. It's working against it in the best ways it can think of. So I shall join it. Christianity, so far as I can understand it, is working against war too. Must be, obviously. So I shall join the church. That's all. Um, Nicholas looked dubious. Not quite all, I fancy. There are things to believe, you know. You'll have to believe them, some of them anyhow. I suppose so. I dare say it's not so very difficult, is it? Very, I believe. I never tried personally, but so I am told by those who have. Oh, well, I don't care. Lots of quite stupid people seem to manage it, so I don't see why I shouldn't. I shall try anyhow. I think it's worth it said Alex, with determination. Well, said Nicholas, after a pause, I dare say you're right. Right to try things, I mean. I suppose it's more intelligent. For a moment the paradox in the faces of both brother and sister was resolved, and idealism wholly dominated cynicism. Well, said Nicholas again, his luck. He finished his punch. It had, as he had said, too many pips, so that he drank with care and rejections rather than hope. End of chapter 16「Seventeen of Non Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. New Year's Eve. On this surely most unusual planet, nothing is more noticeable than the widely differing methods its inhabitants have of spending the same day. One person's New Year's Eve, for instance, will be quite different from another. Even within the Orm family they were different. Margot spent the evening at a canteen concert. She took a prominent part in the programme, having a charming, true and well-trained contralto voice. She sang charming songs with it, some of them a little above the taste of the majority of soldiers, but pleasing to the more musical, others not. It was a long and miscellaneous programme, varying from Schubert and Mendelssohn, to stammering Sam, and turn the lining inside out till the boys come home, so every one was pleased. 2. Dorothy Orme was assisting at a dance at the hospital. You must do something with soldiers on New Year's Eve. It is particularly urgent that they should be kept indoors, because of the Scotch. It was a jolly dance, and both the soldiers and nurses enjoyed it extremely. When twelve struck, they joined hands and sang Old Lang Syne, and everyone hopefully wished everyone else a Happy New Year. Only two jocks had got out and kept their hogmany elsewhere, and quite else how, a creditably small proportion out of forty men. Dorothy got home by two, said it had been a topping evening, and she was dead tired, and went to bed. 3. At Wood End, Mr. and Mrs. Orme entertained Belgians, nine Belgian children and parents and guardians to correspond. They played games and danced a little, 
and fished for presents with a rod and line in a fish pond in a corner of the dining room, where Mr. Orme lay curled up, secretive and helpful, so that the right things got on to the right hooks. It was a great success and ended at ten. Mrs. Orme's head ached and Mr. Orme's back. They had had a great deal to do. They had had Mademoiselle Verstigal to help them, but none of their children, who were all busy elsewhere, and whom, therefore, they did not grudge. They were generous with their children, as well as with their time, energy and money. 4. Betty Orme, who has hitherto been only remotely referred to in these pages, spent the evening driving three nurses and a doctor from Fruges to Lillers. She was a steady, level-headed child, with a fair, placid face looking out from a woollen helmet, and wide blue eyes like Terry's. She acted chauffeur to a field hospital, drove perfectly, repaired her car with speed and efficiency, and was extremely useful. Her nerves, health and temper were of the best brand. Horrors left her unjarred and merely helpful. The nurse at her side, a garrulous person, said, "'Why, it's New Year's Eve, isn't it? How funny! I've only just remembered that. I wonder what they're all doing at home, don't you?' But Betty was only wondering whether her petrol was going to last out till Lillers. "'I know I'd a lot rather to be out here, wouldn't you?' said the talkative nurse. "'Rather,' said Betty abstractly. Even through their helmets and motor coats and thick gloves, they felt the wind very cold, and a few flakes of snow began to drift down from a black sky. "'More snow,' said Betty. "'It really is the limit. I wonder if it'll be finer next year.' 5. John Orme was in a trench not far from Ypres. It was bitterly cold there. Snow drifted and lay on his platoon standing too, their feet in freezing mud. They were standing too at that hour of the night, 11.30pm, because they had been warned of a possible enemy attack. They had been badly bombarded early in the evening, but that was over. There had been four men hit. The stretcher bearers hadn't come for them yet. They lay, roughly first aided, in the mud. John, vigilantly strolling up and down, seeing that no one slept, John was a very careful and efficient young officer, passed a moaning boy with his arm blown off and his tunic a red mess, and said gently, "'Hang on a bit longer, Everett. They won't be long now.' Everett merely returned beneath his breath, "'My God, sir! Oh, my God!' He could not hang on at all, by any means whatever and there were no morphia tablets left in the platoon. John turned away. Someone said, New Year will be in directly, Ginger. How's this for a bright and glad New Year? John remembered for the first time that it was December the 31st. It didn't mean anything more to him than the 30th. After all, it must be some day, even in this timeless and condemned trench. He didn't believe in this attack anyhow. It had been a ration party rumour, and ration parties are full of unfulfilled forecastings. But he wished he had a morphia tablet for that poor chap. 6. Terry Orme was in his dugout, which was called Funk's Snuggery. It was a very noisy night. The enemy seemed to be having a special New Year's Eve hate. Whiz-bangs, sugar-loaves, beans, all sorts and conditions and shapes of explosive missiles filled the earth and heavens with unlovely clamour. It was disturbing to Terry, who was reading Mazorksky. Terry belonged to that small but characteristic class of persons who read themselves to sleep with music. John preferred Mr. Jorrocks. Terry dug his fingers into his ears and perused his score. There was another man in Funk's snuggery. The other man looked at his watch, waited three minutes, and said, Happy New Year! Terry, stopping his ears, did not respond till he shouted it louder. Terry looked up. What's that? he inquired. Oh, is it? Fancy. Thanks. 
the same to you but i shan't be happy this year unless they let me hear myself think beastly isn't it they say after a time it spoils one's ear wouldn't that be rotten have a stick the stick was of chocolate and they each sucked one in drowsy silence it was next year and still they would not let terry hear himself think he put away mazorksky with a sigh and curled up to go to sleep seven hugh montgomery gordon was in billets in a village in artois he and a friend went out for a stroll in the evening they visited an estaminet where they found poor wine but a charming girl they told her it was new year's eve she told them it was la veille du jour de l'an they taught her to say happy new year and other things she and they all spent a very enjoyable evening absolutely it isn't she said hugh montgomery gordon languidly to his friend as they walked back to their billets don't know when i've seen anything jollier he yawned and went indoors and spent the rest of the year playing auction eight basil doy in camp on the greek mountains sat and smoked in a tent assaulted and battered by a searching northeast wind from bulgaria he and his platoon had been occupied all day in digging trenches and spreading wire entanglements which caught and trapped unwary greek travellers on their own hills basil doy was tired and bored and cold in body and mind a second lieutenant who shared the tent was telling him a funny story of a bomb the enemy had dropped on divisional h q last night and of the general and staff pyjama clad rushing about seeking shelter and finding none but basil was still bored and cold oh lord said the other subaltern presently the year'll soon be done in it's going out without having given us a scrap with the bulgars how sickening why in anything's name couldn't they have sent us out here earlier if at all our government said basil abstracted and unoriginal is slow and sure slow to move and sure to be too late that's why so here we are sitting on a cold hill in a draught with nothing doing nor likely to be to himself he was saying she'd fit on these hills she'd belong here more than to spring hill she's a greek really that space between the eyes and the way she steps like diana oh strafe it all what's the good of thinking savagely he flung away his cigarette a great gust of wind from bulgaria flung itself upon the tent and blew it down then the sleet came and the new year nine west was in church the lights were dim because of zeppelins the vicar was preaching on the past and the future from the texts they shall wax old as doth the garment as a vesture shalt thou lay them aside and they shall be changed and behold i make all things new the year was going to be changed and made new in nineteen minutes and a half west and the vicar too perhaps though tired and despondent the week after christmas is a desperate time for clergymen because of treats were holding on to hope with both hands a desperate time a desperate end to a desperate year but clergymen may not by their rules become desperate men they have to hope they have to believe that as a vesture they shall be changed and that the new will be better than the old if they did not succeed in believing this they would be of all men the most miserable west sat in his stool looking so the choir boys opposite thought at them to see if any among them whispered or any slept but he did not see them he was looking through and beyond them at the vesture ragged and soaked with blood which so indubitably wanted changing once his lips moved and the words they formed were 
How long, O Lord, how long? Which might, of course, refer to a number of things, the war, or the vicar's sermon, or the present year, or indeed almost anything. The sermon ended, and there was silent prayer till twelve o'clock struck. Then, as is the habit on these occasions, they sang hymn 265, Ancient and Modern. 10. Violette had a New Year's Eve party, a quiet party, only the Vinnies to chat and play quiet card games and see the New Year in. At half-past eleven they had done with cards and were conversing. Kate had gone to church at eleven. Vincent and Sidney Vinney were now in Khaki. They had, in view of the coming compulsion scheme, joined the army, territorials, and got commissions. Vincent, being married, had applied for home service only. Sidney, as he had just pointed out to Evie, might get sent anywhere at any moment. But Evie, receiving letters from Hugh Montgomery Gordon at the battlefront, and indeed from many others, was not to be touched by Sid Vinney. Evie was talking to young Mrs Vinney about the fashions. "'Those new taffeta skirts at Robinson's are ten yards wide, I should think. You wouldn't believe it, the amount there is to them, and quite a yard off the ground. We shall have to think so much about our feet this next year. Feet! Well, more than that, too.' Mrs. Vinney said, "'Well, do you know, I don't think it's right at a time like this. Not ten yards. I say nothing against six, because we women must try and carry on, and look smart and so on. It would never do for the men to come home and find us skimpy and dowdy and peculiar like some of those suffragettes. What I say is, it'll be lucky for the girls with neat ankles this year.' They said a little more like this, till it was time to mix the punch. Then they drank it and said, Here's how, and a very happy new year to all and many of them, and here's to our next festive gathering, and here's to the ladies, and luck to our soldiers, and other things respectively suitable. Then the Vinnies went home to bed, because Mrs. Vinnie did not approve of making nights of it at times like these. Soon after twelve, Kate came back from church. Kate said, it's turned so cold outside, I shouldn't wonder if we get snow. Those Primrose people are spending a terribly loud evening. I heard it all across the common. You'd think people would want to be somewhat quieter on New Year's Eve, and this year in particular, with all these sorrows and zeppelins about, she meant. A quiet evening with a few friends is one thing, but it doesn't seem quite fitting to have all that shouting and banjos and I could smell the drink as I passed, for they had a window open, and it was wafted right out at me. "'Well, now,' said Mrs. Frampton, "'just fancy that.'" 11. The year of grace, 1915, slipped away into darkness, like a broken ship drifting on bitter tides on to a waste shore. The next year began, End of chapter 17 End of Non-Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay